Good afternoon and welcome to our last meeting of October. Halloween is right around the corner and we're looking yeah. forward to getting into November and December. The invocation tonight will be given by myself and respects to the flags will be given by Councilman Rick Lockridge. Please rise. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the many opportunities that you have bestowed upon this community. We ask that you give this policy-making board a guiding hand as it goes about the business of making wise and prudent decisions for our municipality. We ask that you keep our citizens um, who live within our city and also our community um, strong, safe, and healthy. We ask that those members of our city team who occasionally get put in harm's way, that you protect them and, and lead them in the right direction. And Father, we ask all these things in your name. Amen. 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 I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. The minutes of our October the 14th meeting have been distributed. Are there any corrections or additions to the minutes? I move they be adopted. First by Mr. Larker, second by Mr. Roberts. <coughs> All those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed? The minutes of October 14th pass unanimously. We have two items of old business, and the first item is request second and third readings of Ordinance 13-14 to rezone 312 East Morris Street from R5 single-family residential to RM10 multifamily residential. Ms. McConnell. Uh, thank you, Mayor. The property in question has four structures on one parcel of land. Uh, as you will remember, in order to take these four structures and um, renovate those into individual dwelling units, it's necessary to rezone this property to multifamily zoning. Uh, the property is currently in ownership of the Palmetto Trust, so remember that the uh, current owner will, as far as the renovation is concerned for these four houses, will not only have to comply with the uh, requirements of the Board of Architectural Review, but also um, you will have to pass the test of the Palmetto Trust to make sure that these cabins are historically maintained in, in terms of their integrity. Uh, we've had no additional calls or comments um, regarding this since your uh, first reading. Thank you. Um, we did have a good discussion um, at our last meeting. Any other Questions or comments for anyone? I move that we approve this on second reading. Uh, first by Dr. Thompson. Second. Second by the Mayor Pro Tem. Discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Passes unanimously on the second reading. I Make move it. that it be adopted on the third reading. Uh, first by Mr. Lockridge. Second. Second by Mr. Harbin. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? It passes unanimously on the third and final reading, and appreciate the um, the board architect review and Maurice and your folks for guiding us through this process. A second item is request second and third reading of Ordinance 13-15, amending amending Article 2 of Ordinance 12-04 regarding the City of Anderson's wastewater pretreatment program. Ms. McCall. Uh, this particular ordinance um, is one that is designed to clarify things that in our existing ordinance. It has been reviewed uh, by DHEC, and they have sent back several items which they ask for additional clarification. The changes that are in the ordinance that we've submitted are those that were uh, requested uh, by DHEC, and they are... Um, I would say with items one and two, um, they simply, number one, defines whose authority 
uh, is whose being the city's authority or approval and the other is being uh, DHEX authority, so it just defines those. Number two specifically um, clarifies whether you're talking about the state regulations that are being cited or whether it's federal regulations which are being cited. And the item, the last item, which talks about specific pollutants, DHEC had indicated that if we wanted to um, adjust that list of pollutants, we could. We have made no changes to that list of pollutants, uh, believing that we should, in fact, have things that we are, that we list as um, prohibited, but we can always revisit that list should we need to in the future. We also have um, Joe Ryan with us tonight if you have other other questions but again this is taking our existing ordinance making uh, changes to it uh, with DHEX um, approval and review and this will allow us to uh, move forward with any new industrial permits and any existing permits that need to be renewed upon their expiration so a lot of uh, formality um, more so than um, wide-scale wide changes in the ordinance. Great. Thank you. Uh, questions? I have one. There. What type of pollutants are we leaving out? Well, uh, and I might get Joe to help me, but one example that we gave was t toluene, which has, for example, a low flash point, and we felt like it was in our best interest to um, to make sure that if there, if we had questions about particular uh, pollutants and we thought that it was in our best interest to make sure that it stayed as a prohibitive um, pollutant, then we included that in the list. I, I'm now getting out of my area, but Joe, anything you want to add? No, the one that he had was tyrene and, and it has a real low flash point and just for public safety, What what is toluene used for? Like an alcohol of, of, uh, Joe, do me a favor. Once you come to the mic, probably somebody watching on TV wants you to wants to hear this. <laughs> I don't think he heard you. He didn't. Did he? Would you come up here to the mic? <clears throat> Hmm? What was the question? What was the question? Uh, toluene. What? What kind of? It's an alcohol-based uh, substance that uh, manufacturing uses. Um, it has a, a kind of a peculiar smell to it. Um, but like I say, it uh, has a flash point like 145 degrees, and and Mr. Caldwell just felt like that was that was a little bit low. You know, to be going through your public sewer, somebody flip a cigarette in there, or, or um, something like that, and then we'd have a problem. So. Okay. Yeah. Any other questions, comments? I move we adopt it on the second reading. Uh, first by Ms. Lockridge. Second. Second by Mr. Anderson. Further discussion? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? It passes unanimously on the second reading. I'll make a motion we approve it on third reading, Mayor. I have a first by Mr. Harbin, second by Mr. Roberts. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? It passes unanimously on the third and final reading. Thank you, Joe. That's some good night. We'll move on to new business. The first item of new business is request considerations of the Accommodation Advisory Committee, better known as ATAX recommendations. Mr. McConnell. Um, the accommodations tax, as you all know, is the um, dollars that are generated by the 2% <coughs> that is applied to lodging within the city. So these dollars that are generated are dollars that are returned back into our community uh, to use specifically to attract and provide for tourists 
and they must be spent on tourism related activities. Um, this is uh, not a whole lot is new with your package tonight. I think you found at your desk the summary sheet of all of the um, 27 applications that we received. Um, compared to last year, uh, we had $83,000 to allocate last year. We have $96,000 to allocate this year. Uh, we always get more requests for dollars than we have available. But I, I, and I have to always preface this by saying that while these dollars are for tourism purposes, we recognize, and certainly your ATAX committee recognizes, that tourism in Anderson, in the city of Anderson, is different than tourism in Myrtle Beach or Charleston. So we have to look at the projects and the activities, the events that come forward as request and determine how those projects will uh, benefit our community and we can regenerate those dollars. So one of the things that you will see this, <coughs> in this year's list is you will see a continuing theme of a, a lot of those are, are events that have been um, really good events for our community in years past. You'll see new things, which you saw a little bit last year, uh, concerning sports tourism and also cultural tourism. And um, again, different this year, there are a couple of things that may look a little odd to you, such as the Honeypath Arts Center uh, was an applicant this year. Uh, I pointed out as being a little bit different because it's not for an event in Honeypath, it is for events that that center is applying for that are happening in Anderson. Uh, very similar to the Belt and Tennis uh, Championships, which of course, uh, occur, although Belton is the host and um, tennis courts all over the community are used for that event, they stay in our um, hotels here in Anderson, which is a good thing. So the um, just kind of as a refresher, what the uh, committee really looks toward is the um, applying entities' tourism track record, their data collection, what do they put forth in terms of of information that supports their uh, tourism substantiation. They show their advertising and promotion expenses. We look at the economic benefit that is generated. And lastly, their ability to sustain, um, attract and sustain tourism. It's important also that the um, applicant, um, that we, as applicants, we look at where those um, a tax dollars are being generated geographically. Are they being generated within the city? Um, that's part of our ability to leverage those dollars. So um, the formula prescribed by law is out of those total dollars collected, um, and <coughs> the total total dollars collected, the first twenty five thousand comes off the top and goes to your general fund. Um, you, you also get an additional 5%. That means we have about $30,000 that goes in that pot. The balance, 30% of the balance of those collections, you, you spend to help fund the CVB, which is our designated tourism entity. And then the rest of the dollars, which in this case is the 96,000, are the dollars that are allocated by law for tourism-related expenditures. And they fund those various activities um, that these organizations have requested. Um, just, just to make you feel good, um, this year we had, in terms of total collections, we had $165,000 in total that was collected in ATAX as compared to last year's $152,000. So our lodging has um, seen an increase in those dollars. And I will um, certainly take this opportunity to thank the committee for spending their time to go through all of these applications. The committee is made up of seven people. Two of those represent the lodging industry. We have two who represent the restaurant industry, one a cultural representative, and two people citizens serve at large. Um, so uh, I'll be happy to 
um, answer any questions or go over any of the particular ones that you want. The only other new thing that I would point out to you is you had a couple of requests for capital, um, for dollars to be used for capital expenses, as in brick and mortar money. Um, the committee felt like the since we don't get vast sums of dollars to distribute, they uh, did uh, recommend in, in one case, which was the um, art center, the art center asked for dollars for a new sign um, advertising their location. And the ATAX committee did recommend that some dollars be um, applied to that, but they really felt like for the present time, they felt like brick and mortar dollars were not where their first priority should go uh, because they felt like unless it was specifically brick and mortar for pure tourism related, they felt like the dollars would be better spent on um, advertising and promotion of events and activities. Thank you. I'm glad that our our accommodations um, tax went up this year. That's a positive sign. I was um, talking to the mayor of the Isle of Palms, and I think their accommodations tax is like $2 million. <laughs> and tourism is just different in the upstate of South it Carolina. Is. I mean, it tourism is, is a, a coastal thing, and we're plugging, a, plugging along, but the upstate gets kind of damaged because of that. Any comments, questions? Ms. Chapman? Just something we had spoken about earlier, I mean, just for a personal, I mean, I think it's a bit odd that we are, are allocating money directly for our project, our pet project that we did when I feel like in some ways that the, the money could be better spent by some of the other organizations that have smaller budgets. But I mean, I, I think, I certainly think all of these projects, including our REN project, was, was worthwhile. I just think it's a bit odd that we're funding our own project through this, so. Jerry, start with well, so I know you mentioned something about bricks and mortar projects. What's kind of set one one project apart from the, for instance, the Anderson Woman's Club? You know, they want to put a handicap ramp. You know, that's bricks and mortar. Why? You know, what was the thought process? If you're doing one for one, what what's with the other? The um, specifically for the Woman's Club, the um, the committee felt like number number one the. They did not really have, as a first-time applicant, this was the first time they'd applied, they really didn't have a track record showing that it is um, tourism-based as opposed to just being a, faci a facility that is for the use of its members as, as well as for rent for others. Now, that's not to say that they don't have tourists who, who can come there. So I think there are opportunities perhaps in the future <laughs> based upon their um, really promoting that as a facility that can be used by, by tourists, their opportunity to access those dollars would be better. Thank you. I have to Then, Mr. Lockridge. Um, Mr. McConnell, real quick, what, what does tourism, do they really define tourism? Is it bringing somebody from the outside the community into Anderson, or is it bring in people from the county and from the surrounding counties to Anderson or there's talk on the state level of changing what the definition of tourism is I mean usually it's a um, what's the distance it's well they've taken the distance out they used to say 50 miles if somebody had to travel 50 miles or more than outside their home community then that was a tourist but they they recognize that again we're the barometer for the city of Anderson and a tourist is different from Charleston, a, 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 a major tourist attraction like Charleston, for example. Mm -hmm. So really now the, the burden of proof is on the local community to prove through their data collection that those people you're calling tourists came from somewhere beyond outside your home community. That's what they look at. 
So they give us, at this point, they give us a lot of latitude. And remember, too, that when we, we have to submit, um, not only do each of these applicants have to submit reports to us to get reimbursed for their expenses, but we have to take their information and submit it to the state in an annual report that talks about the data they collected and how they did what they said that they were going to do. So we've, we've all become much more accountable for the dollars. But the Tourism Review Committee, Tourism <coughs> Expenditure Review Committee at the state level looks at all of the projects to determine and ask questions if they think it's really not benefiting tourists. And, and I'd just like to thank the members of the committee because when you don't have enough pie to go around, it can't be an easy decision to uh, choose what product, what f uh, functions to fund and uh, which ones not to. Thank you. Ms. Lockridge. I want to say something positive. Uh, the other day I was registering in Greenville to, to see a doctor, and the gentleman was, that was registering me noticed that I had my hat on, said Electric City, asked me what I, whether I worked for the city of Anderson. I said, yeah, I'm a city councilman. He said, oh, just have to tell you some wonderful things. He says, you know, one of the things that I always go to Anderson for is the car show. He said, that is one of the best things you guys have got going. He said, I enjoy it every year, and I always come. So we have some, we have some positive things happening because of the money we're being sp that's being spent. Good deal. Any other comments, questions? I move that we approve this recommendations from this committee. First by Second. Thompson. Second by Mr. Lockridge. For the discussion. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Passes unanimously. Second item is request consideration of a contract with Clemson University regarding public education and awareness of the stormwater program. Ms. McConnell. Um, the city of Anderson, um, we do have a, we are regulated certainly by um, EPA and um, DHEC as it relates to our stormwater and that's all part of the Clean Water Act and we have uh, you will probably remember there are six minimum control measures that the city of Anderson has to report on each year and and we have to show that we're um, actively uh, working in each of these areas and those areas in addition to the public education and outreach which is the part of what's before you tonight. We also have public participation, illicit discharge and elimination, uh, construction site runoff control, post-construction stormwater management, and then pollution prevention and good housekeeping. So the, um, we certainly are, um, have a lot on the radar as it relates to the stormwater activities that we take on. Uh, we, we do know that, and that as far as our trying to get information out is public education and outreach. We've already done some things that you will know. We have um, uh, pet waste stations. We have uh, information on our website. We, we do certain amounts of things. I think what we're really trying to do in, in this, with this particular request is look at a, a way where we not only can um, collaborate with other entities who are in this same business as the size of our city and our stormwater system, but we're also uh, looking at ways to do a better job on informing the public and letting them help us uh, have cleaner, healthier um, water and a better environment. Carolina Clear is a program that is put together by Clemson University Extension Service and they already have um, a program designed for uh, Pickens County and some other cities in Pickens County and Anderson County uh, just um, this past week um, has also approved a contract with Clemson University. The um, contract, there are two, actually two things in this request. One is a memorandum of understanding, which is very basic about what Carolina Clear will do in terms of the public education and the outreach. And then the contract itself is more specific with regard to the 
activities that they propose to do for the city of Anderson. The, um, the contract is a five-year term at $15,000 per year. Either party can terminate the contract with 30 days notice. And of course, the funding itself would come from your stormwater budget, which has professional services component in it of $34,000. Um, Adam Cromer is our stormwater manager. He's with us tonight if you have particular questions. I know one of the questions um, um, that um, was asked earlier is in regard to the 34000 how that amount of money was ar arrived at, and it is based upon our population. Um, that's where that particular dollar amount comes from. Um, you talking about which number are you talking about? The, the 34,000, the 15, the, excuse me, not the 34,000, the 15,000 15, per year, thank you. The 15,000 per year is based upon your, your population. And we can certainly answer questions if you have them. Um, we do have, yes, a TV station, which uh, we have the ability to put information on, on our community access channel. We have the ability <coughs> to use our website and our social media, and those, the, and we do use those. I think this would be um, raising the level of our ability to um, put that information out to the public. It also gives us an opportunity to to expand that program to um, to a level that um, we feel like other other cities and other communities in our MS4 category are, are doing. Thank you. Um, do you have any questions or comments, Dr. Thompson? This is mandated federally. It is. Uh, it, the, the mandate, Dr. Thompson, is that we actually have a public education and outreach program. The, um, the, the, the mandate does not go so far as to say absolutely specifically you shall do um, these things in your public education and outreach. So they do allow you to customize it, which is really what this particular program tries to do. Mr. Mayor. When I was reading this over, it seemed a little vague, uh, Adam, on some of the things that we're getting for this. Can you be a little more specific on the types of things that would be done? And also let the people of the community sort of know what and if, the, what's this money being used for? Yes, sir. I had the privilege of attending the Pickens County Stormwater Partners meeting last week, and their uh, program they've set up through Carolina Clear that uh, the City of Liberty, uh, easily, City of Pickens and Pickens County are all involved in it. It's a very, very well-run program uh, through there. And I have a, a copy of their last year's annual report. I could be happy to pass around if that's allowed to kind of let you see oh, yeah. the services that they've provided to Pickens County last year. <coughs> But I don't know if you noticed or not, last week they had an advertisement that ran on uh, WYFF during the morning and <coughs> evening news, uh, dealt with Carolina Yards, and that's just one of many uh, advertisements they've run in the past. They've also, uh, just from June to October of this year, they've been involved pretty much daily with uh, educational programs with the uh, elementary schools, with uh, Boy Scout, Girl Scout groups. Uh, rain gardens, installing rain gardens and rain barrels, uh, programs dealing with those. Uh, they're involved in uh, car wash fundraisers. Uh, they actually had buckets they provided to <coughs> folks that were doing fundraisers for car washes. So anything like that to educate the public on safe practices dealing with anything stormwater related, and pollutants in the stormwater. Mr. Chapman. The, the booklet looks like it's got a lot of good information in it, but how is that distributed to the public? The information in the booklet is the activities that they performed for Pickens County last year. But how does that information get put out to the public for them to read that booklet? Well, it's, the booklet is a summary of their activities that they provided for Pickens County last year. I was just looking at it. They have a website uh, that talks about Rain gardens, rain <laughs> barrels, even beaver management right. and hog management. 
So, I mean. We've got chicken management here. Uh, <laughs> I have some questions. Mr. Kirby. <laughs> uh, and I'm not sure who, who I need to direct this to, but am I correct in my understanding, maybe the city attorney can address this, but the <coughs> law we're talking about has six items that we have to address in some form or fashion. The law does not specify how we have to do that per se. That's right. It does not mandate that we hire an outside source to provide this type of service, does it? No, you're correct. And we can we are totally at liberty to create in house programs and come up with uh, in house efforts on our own to fulfill that part of the law. Yes. And have we tried to do that? We have done that, yes, sir. Uh, as well, have we had any uh, reprimand or any uh, criticism or any inquiry from any federal agency that says y'all are not doing a good enough job with this? I don't think so. No, sir, okay. Well, this, <coughs> you said this program is, uh, apparently it's, it's existing and it's, uh, they're working with Pickens County and some cities there and Anderson County and some cities. And this is Clemson University. Uh, and so we're just going to jump in on the bandwagon, I guess, is the idea. And then they, they look at our population and they say, well, uh, if you're going to jump on the bandwagon, you got to pay. How many people y'all got out of there? Okay, well, it's so much. It's, it's 50 cents a piece. So that's your fees, $15,000. And we'll just plug you into the to the website that we have already going. Is that kind of what we're talking about? No. Well, um, yes. I mean, I'll, be, I'll be honest with you. I have a severe problem with this idea because, number one, I think it's unnecessary. Number two, I think that uh, the money that we generate from the stormwater fee, first and foremost, ought to be used to, re to do projects that, that help stormwater not a feel-good bureaucratic PR effort that helps somebody else with their budgetary issues like Clemson University or whoever it may be uh, I, you know Clemson University is a fine fine organization and they are they are state supported school and it's sort of it's sort of odd that you know we got a state supported school that's trying to make money off of the, the local governments that they're are part of the state also it just doesn't make any sense to me and I just see this as a as a way to uh, just throw some money away on, on something that <coughs> it might be nice if we just had <coughs> money overflowing the coffers and just couldn't think of anything else to do with it except maybe get it back to the people that, that we got it from which would be my first choice reduce the fee if we got that kind of money but most importantly, it's taken away the dollars that are going to be available to do projects like we've done that have been very well received, very successful, and very needed. And we got a lot of them out there still to do. And I mean, I, I had a concern when we first started out on this uh, stormwater thing about the, what, how you going to handle the money. And then the next idea comes like, oh, well, we got to have some personnel. We got to have stormwater manager. We got to have an assistant. We got to have this, that, and other. And, you know, so well, okay. If you got to have it, you know, that's taking away money from the projects. But okay. And now we have a staff for the stormwater that's using up a considerable amount of the funding. And but now we want to farm out the work to some third party. And it just doesn't make any sense to me. The, and the final point I want to ask about is. You indicated as a justification that there's $34,000 in the professional <laughs> services component of the budget. Well, the, the next item on the agenda is a request to spend $20,000 right. for professional services. That's right. And then you're going to spend $15,000 on this. We're already over the $34,000, and we hadn't even paid to <clears throat> any professional services to do any projects. And that money's already exhausted for, this, for the coming year. So I just... I think it's a poor idea, and I think we ought, to, we ought to make every effort we can to do this in-house without spending this kind of money. If that doesn't work, and if, if the government comes in, federal government comes in and says, y'all not doing a good enough job, you got to do better, then we might think about something like this. But I think it's premature at this point. Mr. Chairman. 
I guess just to add a little bit to that, one of the, a couple of things that I circled on here is that several of the things that it's saying that that will be provided, most of them we do now in-house. Everything from newsletters, community calendars, government access channels, uh, we do our own water bills. It seems like that would be the perfect opportunity that if you've got some information that we need to send everybody, everybody who's getting the, the sewer bill and the water bill, that's a perfect opportunity. You put that, put a piece of paper in there that's colorful to let them read it, and it would it would educate the public that way. We um, we, we do I for mean, the ones that don't have the channel or don't look at the, the TV channel or some of the other <laughs> avenues that we we do perform those activities now. I will say that this takes the program to a, a higher level. It uh, it helps. Uh, with the program the county has going, uh, duplication of services uh, just throughout the region here, and also with the upcoming uh, water quality, uh, there, there's a new general permit coming out. It's due out in January, and there's, there'll be a lot more stringent water quality requirements. And educating the public is a large component of <coughs> if the public's aware of what they're dumping into the storm sewer systems, that helps with the water quality downstream. and. You know, that gets into what we'll be talking about in our next. Well, are they going are they going to block off the computer access on the, on the program you're talking about? The county's doing. Are they going to block off all the city residents from accessing that? <laughs> no, are they going to block off the city residents from participating in any aspect of the county's program? No, sir. I, I don't believe we'd be able to to say that we were a part of. Now, I don't think we'd be able to use that as as, as us being a uh, a part of that. But those activities well I, I, I agree with you there but I'm, I think the, the point is to, to give education to the public and if they get an education any way they're getting it is fulfilling that mandate I, I, do have, have, oh, I'm sorry, I just wanted to ask is that is that part of the public awareness is the the disc that are put on the sewer uh, sewer manhole covers that is that, yes, that basically say do not throw certain things in here that's yes part of that. okay Anything else? Well, I think, you know, and I hear what Steve is saying, it looks like a real good program that Clemson is helping us to do. Not saying that we don't have a staff in-house that could do a lot of those things. I'm sure they couldn't probably do many of the things. And I think uh, it's a matter of whether or not we want to expand the education to the public. Uh, whether we think that what we are doing in-house could be expanded to accommodate what is mandated by the federal government for us to do. So, that, I mean, that's the way I see it. Do we think that we need to expand this with Clemson University or anybody else? It's a public awareness. And uh, that they would do a lot more than we could do here with our staff. Well, there's tell, me, tell me a little bit more about what, what's happening in January. The new DHEC permit coming out, we uh, were issued a permit back in 2007. It was the first uh, six years of our, our program. It was up for renewal in uh, 2011, and DHEC's been delaying it for uh, a year and a half, two years now. And uh, this, this new permit will have more stringent water quality. Are there uh, consequences for not meeting those qualities? There will be, and it's a phase plan that within five years they want you to, to, to be up to another level. and, and the next uh, agenda on the item will, will kind of get into some of those requirements as well. So, so really, um, Mr. Curvin is correct in the sense that yes, can can your current staff perform these activities? We are already doing some of these things. Uh, what the Carolina Clear participation would do would be, Dr. Thompson, as you said, would be um, elevating that. Um, amount of public education uh, but as we already said there's there's no um, specific barometer out there that says how much of these things we have to do I think that the critical thing for us whether it's us doing it in-house or whether it's doing it with somebody else's professional assistance is our ability to to let the public understand that for water quality to improve and for us not to um, uh, reach some point where we do have um, difficulties that we're encountering from the 
uh, other mandates, then it is it is important that we make sure we try and educate the public about the things that are important or things they can do to help. But we have no problem either way. We, we can try to amp up our own internal efforts and um, spend those dollars otherwise. Ms. Lockridge. You said one of the things that we want to do is educate people, but at the same time, what it sounds like is happening is that in January we're going to have to increase the quality of the water in the in and that's what it's important not so much the education of the people about the quality of water that am, am i wrong in that assumption well they go hand in hand yeah well let me ask this question kind of follow up on that you know reading this document the the uh, very vague as somebody's already said and uh it's it's all it's, some of it's a little bit weak uh, to be polite about it but I don't see any any measuring stick in here on whether this is going to have any impact or not. There's no nothing in here that says, okay, we're going to do X, Y, and Z, and at the end of a year we're going to be able to do whatever and determine have we actually increased the education of the public <clears throat> about stormwater? How are you going to know that? That's the tough part about the advertising. Well, I know it is, it but I mean, is, if, I mean then where is the line drawn? And say, well, you know, fifteen thousand dollars a year—that's great, but let's do thirty a year. We'll really educate them, you know, twice yeah. as much. I mean, that's always a tough thing about trying to measure your, an awareness. That's probably campaign. a good indication of something you don't need to be doing if you can't measure the results. Well, may I ask? Uh, someone compla was complaining about the taste of the water here in Anaheim. Anyone, anyone else, heard anything about? It? Oh, yes. what a, taste. a lot of people have complained. Yeah, and I was wondering but what's going the, on. That if that's the water. It, that the, it, it, there has been um, an, an odd taste to the water, but as that was explained in terms of the um, water level, you know, the lake level was low, then we had all of the rain and the water went up. It covered up all of the vegetation around the banks as that vegetation underwater began to decay. It began giving off that um, what, uh, strange taste uh, yes ma'am it's not it was not unsafe to drink because obviously that water is still bad. going through your the uh, filtration system at the plant and then distributed out through all of our lines so it as time goes on that has certain you might have noticed that's gotten less and less and less and it wasn't everybody didn't encounter that but but that's where the <coughs> strange taste was coming None of this, this is two different water yeah this is two different waters <laughs> Ms. Ames. Ms. Ames. mr mayor i feel like this is uh, maybe probably just a little premature without some additional information i'm also curious as to what some of the other municipal municipalities are paying as far as their share um, i'm curious about whether or not the federal government is got their eye on us because we're not doing something right or we're doing something wrong. I think there's certainly a lot more information that, that I would want to see before I could vote for this. And I think this thing's a little bit premature. I think if we got down the road and we realized we're going to be stepping on some federal toes and maybe it might be something that we need to consider. But I think at this point, we're already educating people. The county's educating people. Uh, we're in the county. Uh, we don't have a problem with our stormwater as far as the, the federal um, agencies are concerned. So I just think this is a little premature. So, I mean, we could, I don't know if this is something maybe we could make a motion to table it for a later time. You can, can make get, that motion. I'd like to make that motion then. And, and that way we could get some more information and maybe make a better informed decision on whether we should be spending this money. There's a motion on the floor. Second. I have a second. So that tabling means that it's to come back to us. It's like to come back at a later time once we. Any further discussion? All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Passes unanimously. We'll be tabled. Mr. Mayor. Yes. I say one quick thing about that. Okay. Uh, Mr. Cromer, we just have confidence in the job that you're doing. So we just don't want to use anybody else. So you just keep on doing what you're doing. Thank you. And it's not, it's not a reflection on you. That's right. We like the job that you've been doing in the past. We don't feel bad. 
you staying right there in that spot because we're All on right. number three. Request consideration <laughs> of a contract with Wool Wolpert, is that right? That's correct. Incorporation for a watershed assessment study for the stormwater program. Ms. McCollum. Uh, again, this is part of EPA and the Clean Water Act. We do have uh, mandates for monitoring requirements of our stormwater and to assess those water quality conditions. So as, as we were, as Adam was answering some of your questions, this does have a, a bearing on that. Stormwater, of course, doesn't recognize political uh, boundaries or geographical boundaries, and we are trying <coughs> to um, meet the federally mandated component um, with regard to the monitoring requirements. And I'll let Adam address the monitoring requirements just a little bit more, but a watershed assessment would um, tell us more about the stormwater at specific points. It would determine if there are particular pollutants that are of concern in certain places, um, and it would help us develop an, an overall community-wide plan that would, al would allow us to uh, coordinate our efforts with Anderson County, for example, and be able to share some information in, in that regard. Um, this particular contract with Wolpert, you will remember that when we did RFQs for um, on-call engineering services, Wolpert was selected as our stormwater um, engineering consultant and they have in fact been the company that's been working with us on stormwater since the beginning. <clears throat> this particular contract is in the amount of $20,070 $20, and it would help us develop a uh, stormwater surface water monitoring plan. They are s specific about the uh, components of this um, particular monitoring plan and I'll, I'll let Adam address any other particulars or questions that you might have. All right, thank you. Um, questions, comments? Ms. Uh, Kirby. So. This one is a little bit better than the last one, but <laughs> I don't want to go overboard. <laughs> uh, <laughs> let me see if I understand what these people are going to do for us. I'm, I'm looking at the document that we presented here. They're going to do a current data compilation, which basically means they're going to look at all the records we have and the maps and the data and the information, and they're going to kind of put all that together and study over it a little bit. That's right. Is that right? And then they're going to do a desktop GIS assessment, which means somebody's going to sit at a computer and, and look at a bunch of maps and stuff about the city and try to figure out, as they put it, come up with, uh, I believe they said, 10 possible places to go get samples of stormwater runoff in, in the city. Okay. And then once they come up with those, they're going to do field reconnaissance, which means they're going to go out to those sites and look at it and make sure that the bank's not too steep to get down there and get the sample or whatever. Is that fair enough? And then they're going to Number four, they're going to do mapping, which means they're going to mash a button on the computer and give us a map of what they came up with. <laughs> it's not that easy. It's not that easy. Well, it's kind of, I mean, I'm giving you the abbreviated version, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> and then on number five, they're going to give us the final plan, which is a copy of the map with a, their summary of the, 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 the site locations and the data information and so forth. And they're going to tell you, Okay, you go out to these locations, you take samples every week or every month or however often it is, and they may give you more detail on how to do that. I would think we would already know how to do that, but I guess that's part of what they're doing for us. And then they're going to provide project management. And this is one I really enjoyed. Uh, <laughs> says that they're going to, uh, the duties will include, but not be limited to, one project review meeting at the city offices, team meetings, schedule creation and updating, and progress invoicing. So they're going to charge us for sending us a bill, apparently. <laughs> now, the other question I have is, what is the timetable for this to be done, number one? 
I mean, it says in here at one place that these these fee the the hourly rates will be in effect till October the sixth of twenty fourteen. I mean, is this going to take that long to get this done, or is it, it a short term project, or what? It's a short term project. Uh, they anticipate about four months to complete the project. The hourly rate schedule simply, if there were any additional services that would be included, they, they would uh, base their rates off of those hourly rates. Okay, and but tell me what I've left out that they're going to do for us that that we need to be spending this money for. This is an upcoming DHEC requirement in the new general permit that's effective January uh, 2014. And uh, we will have 18 months to develop this watershed assessment plan and map. And, and then the second step of that will be to implement uh, different water quality monitoring areas to take samples and, and keep continuous data of the water quality throughout the streams in the city. Well. Do we not know where we can go get samples now? Well, there, there's a good bit of uh, technical things that need to happen to make that a reality. There's uh, uh, the level of the water at different locations, uh, and there's different methods that, that they would propose uh, as far as grab sampling, uh, setting up uh, permanent water quality monitoring stations could be a, a possibility. Would be some opportunities to look at what the county's done with theirs and any areas that. Uh, are close by to the, to the city limits to share costs on some of those as well. So this is a this is a one time. It's not phase one. This is just this is the project. Is that right? right? But a, a second part to that would be if we get into uh, when they determine any locations uh, within so many other months, we'll need to uh, start working towards getting water quality monitoring areas set up to take samples from. Does that mean that you're gonna come back? in four months or six months and say okay now we need to hire these people to actually go out there and dip the water up and take it to the lab to be analyzed and not necessarily and that would come at a later time to determine how you we think would. that might be a possibility it's a possibility or it could be our staff taking the samples as well let me ask who, who evaluate the samples you do uh, and we take the samples from the various areas and bring them back to the lab then you evaluate we, we do not have a lab to test water quality no oh okay so when you get the samples what do you do with them they would need to go to a, a lab to a lab that could test the water quality is there any way that the water electric city utilities water testers could help with that i'm not sure if they test the same pollutants that we anticipate or or you know we really don't know what pollutants we're dealing with at this time it, this study will help us determine what pollutants are in the creeks that we would need to be uh, Lockerts, checking for. That had to be to do with my question. When you're talking about the pollutants in the water, first of all, we don't know what they are. Am I correct? Now in the Savannah Basin, which is where most of our water goes, there's impairments of turbidity and uh, fecal coliform. Okay. The second question is, if we find that there is a problem, with water quality then we take the money and spend it on increasing the quality of the water that's dumped into savannah basin correct it would be determining where the impacts are coming from that are creating the problem okay mr Tab, i just want to ask is does dhec prohibit us from doing this or do they require a third party to do what's being asked or do we just don't have the manpower to it's, do this? It would be cost prohibitive to, it, you're talking about for this uh, watershed assessment study? Uh, uh, Wolpert has the expertise in performing okay. this to get us where we need to be to determine our next step if, if we go out and take samples or the locations where we take the samples from, they, they really have the expertise in determining that information. Okay, thanks. Anything else? I move that we go ahead and adopt this um, contract with Wolpert. Of first second of second by Dr. Thompson for discussion well I'd just like to say that you know I don't have a problem doing this as a one-time operation but I do want to encourage our uh, stormwater department and, and management in general that we need to be self-sufficient to the fullest extent possible we find out when we get this information and they say here are the places where you need to sample and here's how you need to do it and I think we need to look very, very hard at trying to do that in house. Yes, sir. Uh, can I ask one other statement before we're in discussion? Um, 
if we were to set up a lab, how expensive would that kind of situation be? I don't know that we know the answer to that. Um, we'd be glad to do a little homework on it in terms of kind of the next things on the horizon. Uh, to Mr. Curvin's point about trying to be as self-sufficient as we can, we can begin to identify some of those things and try to corral that a little bit better for you. But I, I, I would tell you right now, um, and, and we'll, we'll send you some additional information, but the, the, um, the, just looking at Public Works and their uh, stormwater request that, that come in every week, I mean, y'all know how wet a season we had, and, and there are um, a number of, of issues that are out there that these guys are looking at every single day. So uh, I don't want you to think they're over there twiddling their thumbs. No, they we certainly that. are not. And, okay. and, but I think to, to help y'all get a handle on it a little bit better, we can give you some additional information so that we can work toward um, doing um, – using their expertise and, and doing a lot of this um, that we would have the capability to do in the future. You're right. Not to prolong this, but, times. and I know we need to be as prudent as possible in saving our money, but when you think about the importance of water quality, and it's going to get even more important as we move on because of all the pollutants that go into the water, yeah. killing the fish or whatever it is, there are people out there, even though we can do a lot here in-house, I think there are folk who deal strictly with this that can give us some assistance. So I don't have any problem with getting someone to help us out on that, Steve. Yeah, you know, I, I really think that that would be an asset to us rather than uh, something that's not good for us. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Chip. I just, just to clarify, this, this uh, agenda item is mainly dealing with stormwater quality, mm -hmm. water not the amounts of the areas that people were getting stormwater in excess. That's correct. Okay. That's correct. I just wanted to clarify. Yeah. All those in favor, say aye. Aye. Opposed? Passes unanimously. Administrative briefing. Ms. McConnell. Uh, we do have an, uh, a need for a new municipal election commission member. Uh, you will remember that we have a three-member commission composed of David Ford, Clara Humphrey, and Sarah and Could you repeat those? I didn't hear the term. We have David Ford, who, Clara Humphrey, and Tom Kozell, who are your three current members. Dr. Kozell's term expires in December 31 of this year, and he has indicated that uh, while he's enjoyed serving, uh, he'd like to share that uh, joy of service with someone else. <laughs> um, so since we do have um, an election coming up next year, we would like to um, seek someone to replace him. Um, this is a six-year term. Please don't be alarmed at the fact that it's a six-year term. We have an election every two years, so it's not like they, they are called upon uh, for um, um, service on on an uh, overburdened time commitment. Um, but please be thinking about that. If you know of someone who would be interested in serving, please let us know, and we'll put them in touch with our um, application process. Uh, on your calendar, um, October is, um, we're almost coming to the end of October. We will have the last block party on Halloween oh, at wow. Carolina Wren Park. Oh, and then in November, we already started the month off on a, a busy note with the Recreation Committee meeting on the 5th, the Downtown Committee on November the 7th. Uh, if you plan to attend the Anderson County Municipal Association meeting in Pelzer, uh, please let Brandy know. And on Sunday, November the 10th, you know, we're, we're a big city these days. We've got multiple events happening in the same day. Um, the All Saints Day, which we've had as um, um, an event put on by the city in the past, it's been very successful. We'll do something a little bit different 
uh, this year, but it will be at 3 p.m. at Silverbrook Cemetery. You've got a flyer at your uh, desk that the this is Eat, Pray, and Serve. Uh, it's a take on the Eat, Pray, Love book series. But this is different this year. It'll be a series of of six people who are buried at Silverbrook and a little uh, kind of one act, um, one, one man play at, on each of these people, um, a theatrical performance of sorts. And I think it will be um, very fun and very interesting. We've made the history of these people come to life. In addition to that, the Veterans Day Parade is at 3 p.m. that same day. We will be closed on Monday in observance of Veterans Day on the 11th. Public Safety Committee meets on the 12th. And then uh, Thanksgiving, um, Thursday the 28th and the 29th, we will be uh, closed in observance of, of that holiday. And, Mayor, that's all we have. Linda, you referred to, and this thing refers to Silverbrook Cemetery. That's uh, that. Old Old or new or no, we've or taken the old off. All one. We've taken the old off because we have new Silverbrook. So if it's just Silverbrook, it's Silverbrook and new Silverbrook. Okay. Correct. <laughs> it's not old anymore. It's not old. It is old, but <laughs> that is true. We have um, Boy Scouts out here today. Uh, Montessori. Yes. Montessori Boy Scouts. Who you? you what's your troop? Troop 97. 97. Troop 97. Glad to have you guys with us. Let me set out of that. I will entertain a motion to adjourn. First so by moved. Mr. Harbin. Second. Second by Mr. Roberts. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? We stand adjourned.